Hi, everyone. My name is Maya Shakari. I'm a criminal defense lawyer, and I'm here today uh, to interview two uh, very um, esteemed guests. Uh, they're very, very well known in uh, Ontario and in the legal profession, in criminal defense especially, and even outside of criminal law. Uh, my two guests are Neha Chug and uh, Gerald Chen. Uh, they're criminal defense lawyers. And the reason why I want to interview them today is because they're both running in the upcoming venture elections. The elections start in April, and um, this election has been... Um, causing some kind of division, or um, let's say there are different points of views about them, lots of questions. I personally don't really know much about that. And I thought that by interviewing both Neha and Gerald, uh, I can get answers to many of the questions I have about the elections. And I'm hoping that those questions are questions that many of you also have, and that you will find answers to the questions that uh, you have about the election. So I'm going to start right away with my first question, which is, uh, and it's to both of you, um, why should criminal defense lawyers care about the venture elections? And Mimi, Gerald, if you can start, that would be great. Sure. I'll, I'll give just a few reasons from my perspective. Uh, anyways, why the criminal defense bar ought to care and care deeply about uh, the venture elections coming up. Uh, the first I'd, I'd say is, is equity, diversity, and inclusion. Uh, criminal defense lawyers know all about representing uh, marginalized clients. Uh, we are the bar that uh, created jurisprudence in cases like Gladu and, and Lee and Morris and Sharma. Uh, we understand that not all of our clients start from the same place in life and that uh, many have carried the burden of racial discrimination for longer than others, uh, in some cases generations. Uh, and that has real consequences for what we do as a bar and as a profession uh, in terms of trying to level the playing field. And so I think criminal defense lawyers have a unique understanding of this, uh, given uh, the work that we do day in and day out in the courts. And that's a central part of this election is the two very different visions that the full stop slate on the one hand and the venture good governance coalition on the other have about the role that the law society should be playing in pursuing a more equitable, inclusive, and diverse uh, profession for the benefit of the public. And so that's one reason I would give. Uh, the second reason I'll give is the importance of self-regulation uh, and the role that that plays in maintaining the independence of the bar, which the criminal defense uh, uh, bar should uh, uh, care about um, just as much, if not more, than other uh, segments of the profession. I mean, we are, represent our clients against the government uh, all the time. Uh, and so I don't think we want the government to be the ones uh, setting those standards and rules for our profession. Uh, we very much have an interest in preserving self-regulation. And I think we often take it for granted that it's always going to be the case that we'll regulate ourselves. But that's not necessarily so because we're seeing encroachment uh, on that in other jurisdictions. And I think if we want to preserve the privilege of self-regulation, we have to show that we're up to the task of getting things done, of tackling hard issues. Uh, regrettably, that's not been the case, I think, in the last four years because of the uh, division and the toxic atmosphere at convocation. And that's uh, something that the Good Governance Coalition and certainly myself and, and I know Neha um, are very much intent on addressing if elected. Thank you, Gerald. Neha, what about you? Why do you think from the lawyers should care about this? <laughs> I couldn't agree with Gerald more, as usual. Um, but... Uh, um, where I'm coming from is the rural perspective. My practice is in Cornwall, Ontario. I'm about 500 kilometers plus plus from the Law Society's main building in downtown Toronto. Um, I'm a criminal defense lawyer proudly, but I know that being a criminal defense lawyer is really hard work. Um, I'm a solo, I was a solo practitioner. I I'm now a small firm owner, and most criminal defense lawyers are solo, solo or small firm owners. Some of us don't have staff. A lot of us work of our, out of our homes. Our job is uh, uh, governed by law society rules, the rules of professional conduct. The oversight comes from the law society, but it is a grind, a daily grind, getting up in the morning, getting to whatever courthouse you need to get to, coming back to the office, doing your trust reconciliations, doing your legal aid billing. If you love criminal law and you don't work for the Crown and you don't work for Legal Aid Ontario, 
you're usually out there on your own doing it um, day in, day out. And you do it because you love your community and you love uh, the clients who you work for. The Law Society uh, can provide supports and can give help to solo and small firms. Uh, I'm tired of seeing the infighting at the Law Society. And I want to see more supports, both structural and in the uh, equity, diver diversity and inclusion space that Gerald just talked about uh, for solo and small firms so that criminal defense lawyers can thrive. Thank you, Mayo. So my, ne my next question is, why are you running as a bencher, like each one of you? So maybe, uh, yeah, can you start by answering this question? Sure. So I am running. So my why of why I'm running is I'm running for solo and small firms outside of big urban centers. Um, I uh, 10 years ago when I moved out east, I never thought that this would be my life. And here I am making it work uh, and making the constant juggle of solo and small firms work. And I want to bring more lawyers out to solo and small firms in in rural Ontario we need lawyers and we need to support new lawyers. We need to support new calls. We need to support uh, people who are accredited outside of Canada. We need to support diverse groups to come to rural areas like Cornwall to set up practice because we are seeing a graying of the bar. We're seeing a big loss of lawyers to government and to legal aid and we wish them well, but we need to develop those structural supports and the financial supports and the knowledge-based supports for lawyers to set up practice in, in rural Ontario. And that is my big why. My second why is to restore good governance to the Law Society of Ontario. What I saw in the last four years was uh, lawyers who have young families managing their young families through pan the pandemic, uh, managing their practices through the pandemic, all the while what we were seeing at convocation was infighting and hostility and conflict. What I want to see restored is uh, good conversation, constructive conversation, uh, good governance is uh, the team that I'm running with um, so that we can we can have those, those really fruitful and productive discussions for all 50,000 lawyers plus in Ontario and not resort to uh, infighting and uh, devolving into conflict at convocation. We need to support lawyers. We need to support lawyers in private practice uh, and we need to support criminal defense lawyers. And when we lose that, when we lose that focus, um, we are forgetting about uh, the, the voter base that we serve. Thank you, uh, Neha. What about you, Gerald? Uh, so uh, many of my reasons are, are, are quite similar as I was listening and they had talked. I think what I would say is, look, I, I certainly um, I care deeply about equity and, and uh, ensuring that the profession is in inclusive um, in my previous work. And I've always uh, tried to carve out time uh, in my professional life for, for initiatives where I'm serving uh, the broader public interest rather than just the interests of my clients. And so I was previously served on the board of the Federation of Asian Canadian Lawyers and then as president for a couple of years. And certainly in that capacity, I did a lot of work on equity, diversity and inclusion initiatives. So that is that is certainly one area that I'm interested in. Uh, but my interest uh, uh, in the issues goes far beyond that. I think when I look at the next four years and eight years and 12 years in terms of the challenges that face the legal profession, that we have to address um, uh, with responsible governance, as Nea said. Um, I see uh, challenges of access to justice, the rising cost of legal services, the need to properly fund legal aid and to fund our law libraries for uh, uh, small practitioners and small firms, especially outside of Toronto. Uh, I see the challenges and opportunities presented by emerging technologies, especially with the uh, advent of artificial intelligence. And we're only just at the beginning, even though we're all you know, fascinated by what's what's coming out. I think. Uh, the regulator in the legal profession, as much as any other industry and any other body needs to get ahead of the problem and not simply be reactive. Uh, and I also see the mentorship deficit facing many young licensees. It's been exacerbated by COVID, uh, but not solely contributed uh, to by COVID. Um, and that has implications, of course, for professional competence, which is one of the core mandates of the law society. Uh, I think often, too often, um, uh, you know, we end up promoting competence through the disciplinary process, which is not the way it should be on the back end, uh, rather than uh, uh, investing in real smart uh, ways to do so on the front end. And so 
all of those issues and challenges are ones that I am interested in pursuing uh, uh, if elected to convocation. That's why I'm running. Okay. Uh, thank you, Gerald. And uh, so I will ask both of you, uh, but maybe Gerald, you can answer this first is um, my following question is, what, what do you intend to do if you are elected to improve the situation of criminal defense lawyers in general? Sure, so I'll, I'll talk a bit more about, about uh, legal aid, which you know, touched on, because I think access to justice is so critically important to what we as criminal defense lawyers do. We do such collectively, we do such important and meaningfully, uh, meaningful work, uh, yet uh, are criminally underpaid for it. Um, and, uh, you know, legal aid funding remains a, a sort of constant problem in our profession. Um, uh, the Federation of Law Associations uh, in Ontario uh, uh, has done some advocacy around that recently, where they pointed out that to increase annual spending on legal aid from 350 to 480 million, which may sound like a lot, would do no more than restore funding to 2014 levels. And I think that just underscores uh, how uh, under-resourced legal aid is, has been. And so that certainly is going to be a priority. The Law Society doesn't uh, control Legal Aid Ontario, doesn't fund uh, Legal Aid Ontario, uh, but it is, can play a, a significant role in advocating for access to justice and funding for Legal Aid as a member of ASLA, the Alliance for Sustainable uh, Legal Aid. And so I think that's going to be a critical priority uh, and one area I'd like to focus on if elected to convocation. Uh, and beyond that, I think it's just, you know, this is, sounds more general, but I think it's nonetheless important is to have criminal defense perspectives represented at convocation. And even just to take one example, you know, among other many, among other duties, ventures can serve on the proceedings authorization committee to decide when cases ought to go to discipline. They can serve as adjudicators on the law study tribunal and presiding over disciplinary hearings. And I think it's important, uh, you know, for criminal defense lawyers, uh, if they do, God forbid, get into trouble with the law society, to know that they have peers who understand their practices, who are presiding on those committees and, and on those panels. And, you know, the art bar has had a rich tradition of criminal defense lawyers serving in convocation. Uh, from Jonathan Rosenthal, uh, uh, on the last bench, who's running again, uh, to previous benchers like Alan Gold, uh, and Mark Sandler and my mentor Clay Ruby, um, uh, we've had a long tradition of that. Uh, I don't, uh, uh, I don't uh, uh, think I'll fill any of their shoes, but it's certainly something I'll try my best at, at doing, along with my other criminal defense colleagues like Neha and, and Anna Maria and Azure and Jonathan Rosenthal. Thank you, Neha. So I have a different perspective. First of all, I obviously agree with everything that Gerald has said. He's said it very wisely and a very detailed approach. Um, let me just start with this. Um, butter is now $10. Two liters of milk is $8. A tank of gas is $2. So the, the, the fees that we are feeling in our personal lives are spilling over into the decisions that we make, whether to be a criminal defense lawyer or to go into government, to go in-house somewhere. Crim the criminal defense bar is feeling it. We're feeling it so much. Um, we are in in um, uh, previous decades when lawyers would sell their practices or bring in, um, you know, someone to take over their practices if they were going to retire. Um, we are really, really feeling that improving the situation for criminal defense lawyers. I think would would mean mentorship, retention of lawyers. How do we bring them in so that? Uh, we are not seeing the shuttering of practices that we have seen uh, even more endemically over the, the pandemic um, when we saw so many criminal defense lawyers just closing their doors, canceling their email accounts and walking away from practice. Um, we feel this in rural settings. Um, and so let me go back to butter being uh, you know, $10. Um, mm -hmm. We have not seen an increase in legal aid funding. So when we see, you know, on the back end, lawyers behaving badly or being, you know, in front of the tribunal, there's always a context behind that. There is always a story behind that. Lawyers don't come to the tribunal um, as just a, a black and white, um, you know, absolute mens rea kind of story. They have they have a backstory to that. And I, I see lawyers dealing with mounting financial pressures with, um, with uh, um, legal aid woes, with uh, um, access to justice being um, at the forefront of what they want to serve, 
but unable to serve because of the financial pressures. And so, so I think that's the situation that we need to bring to convocation. And I think as criminal defense lawyers, we are so aware of that situation. We live it, we see it, we breathe it. And so um, I think we can bring that unique perspective to convocation. Okay, thank you, Maya. So that actually, your answer um, I think is, I did. Uh, I, yeah, it kind of answers <laughs> my next question because I was actually going to ask you uh, both about uh, whether you had plans to address the increasing loss of criminal defense lawyers. So obviously, Nea, it seems like this is one of the issues that you're thinking about. So while you're already on that uh, topic, I'll start with you. So, but what more specifically would you do about this if you become a venture? So we are seeing this so acutely in small towns. Um, we are seeing a huge retirement rate or people leaving um, practice altogether. Um, everyone in criminal defense knows about that cold call, the, the Crown cold call, um, calling defense lawyers at their offices and saying, come to the Crown's office. And uh, there being big gaps in criminal defense practice. Where we're seeing this most severely is in that five to 15 year mark. So we're not seeing the five year to 15 year defense lawyer um, that uh, usually populates, you know, a certain level of trial or a certain kind of file in the criminal courts. Um, the what we what I um, have proposed to our local bar uh, is that um, we mentor uh, and we bring in summer students and we bring in articling students uh, to our small town where we we really really need lawyers. Um, but what I would what I would suggest. Uh, uh, in this unique circumstance that we're seeing all over the province are uh, mentorship programs, rural mentorship programs, um, perhaps some sort of bursary or scholarship for um, small firms and solo firms in uh, rural communities to be able to bring in uh, new lawyers, just like we do with physicians, um, to be able to bring in uh, per those legal professionals to serve our small communities. Um, we, uh, our courts have a tremendous backlog as a result of COVID and the access to justice issue that we're also facing from the lawyer gap or the knowledge gap is uh, only making it more severe. So this is something that needs to be, um, there needs to be a focus group. It needs to be taken to the communities. The voices from the public need to be heard and brought back to convocation. All right, thank you. And what about you, Gerald? Do you have any plans <laughs> on this issue or? <laughs> Well, and if so, how do you intend to address this problem? Yeah, I'll, 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 I'll add to and I, I won't repeat what Nay has said, um, uh, but I'll add to it just, just by offering this perspective. Um, I mean, of course, the law society must meet its mandate in a, in a financially uh, prudent and financially responsible way. So I don't want, you know, what I say to be taken as saying, you know, we just need to throw money uh, at the problem. That being said, you know, what this... You know, this issue and all, all issues need is developing smart investments on the front end, because I think we're deluding ourselves if we think that there is not a real um, cost financially and otherwise, but there is a real financial cost to uh, not investing in enough mentorship uh, uh, for criminal defense lawyers on the front end. Because what you're going to get if you have a flight of defense lawyers in that five to 15 year range uh, as Naya has talked about, uh, if you get uh, lawyers who are not properly uh, mentored and trained uh, in the early stages of their career, you're going to get unrepresented accused and underrepresented accused, and that's going to create errors and problems in trials, which is going to lead to retrials, which of course is uh, significantly costlier for the justice system, not to mention the human cost in wrongful convictions and, and other um, uh, negatives for the, the public and the administration of justice. So I think that all has to be part of the conversation when we're thinking and talking about how does the law society serve the public interest in a financially responsible way. Okay, so now uh, I just have one final question for you guys, and maybe I'll start with you, uh, Gerald, Gerald, on that one. And it is, uh, so I mean, I think as we can notice, um, I mean, criminal defense lawyers in general are having a hard time right now because of all the things that you raised, legal aid and other issues. But uh, more specifically, there are the groups of uh, new lawyers or recent calls, um, women in the profession and racialized lawyers have 
even more difficulties than uh, yes. the rest of uh, the lawyers in this profession. So uh, what would your plans be to address the issues that these particular groups have? And actually, I'm asking you guys because you, uh, both of you come from racialized or ethnic backgrounds. Uh, and Neha, you're, you're um, a female defense lawyer and you're both relatively young. You're still, I mean, you, you're not too remote from your uh, recent, call day, recent call days, but even though like you're not recent call lawyers, but still, I mean, you kind of still connect to uh, that group. So what do you intend to do? Do you have plans to address the issues that these groups are facing and what are they? Right, so I appreciate you saying that I'm still relatively young. Uh, I, I, <laughs> What what I'd say is I think we need to be sensitive, obviously, to these issues. We need to know what we don't know and know who does know and know who does have the answer and listen to, and not just listen to, but listen to and empower um, the communities and the groups who are working directly with the communities most affected to ensure that uh, they're having meaningful input into what the law society does. And so, uh, what that means, I think, structurally is ensuring that there is a robust mechanism to consult with uh, racialized lawyers, women in the profession, uh, others who uh, are, are um, disadvantaged uh, or face systemic barriers. Uh, and so one of, not, not the only example, but I'll just offer one example. I mean, there's uh, a group called the Equity Advisory Group, uh, which uh, consists of a number of representatives of different equity uh, deserving organizations. Um, I sat on that group as a representative of the Federation of Asian Canadian Lawyers when I was on the board of, of FACL. Um, that's a group that the Law Society uh, Standing Committee consults with uh, in developing its policies. And that's a group and that's one example of a mechanism that needs to be uh, reinforced uh, and empowered if we are going to uh, uh, approach these challenges in a way that is uh, that uh, is sensitive to and addresses the specific needs of racialized lawyers and, and, and women lawyers and others uh, who face systemic barriers in the profession. All right, thank you. And what about you, Neil? Yes, I also appreciate you calling me young. I just celebrated a big birthday and on this Zoom call can see my gray hairs, so thank you. Um, but I agree, obviously, with everything that Geraldine says. I think that consultation is so key and consultation with groups all over the province so um, I entered a bar that was in Cornwall that was relatively homogenous. Um, and I did so because of marriage and where life took me. And I, uh, um, I didn't have much of a choice. And that's how I got out here and had something like an equity advisory group or uh, discrimination council uh, existed back when I started my practice, I might have had a different approach to how I dealt with, you know, some situations that came up in my, in my practice. Um, uh, I think that the continuation of, of those of those uh, consultation groups and, and those programs, I think is critical. And I think that um, I think that the pandemic was telling for if we talk about women in criminal defense, um, women in criminal defense who were managing homeschooling and parenting during the pandemic, I think that is a great um, uh, case study in how we can improve practice for women in cr criminal defense moving forward um, and recommendations that we can make uh, via the Law Society if we're, we're elected as benchers. All right. Thank you guys so much for taking the time for this interview. Um, and uh, I mean, you answered some of the questions that I had, and I hope that um, you've answered the questions that other people may have. Uh, about uh, the election. So I wish you luck. And um, so we'll see how it goes. But thank you very much. And I appreciate your time. And uh, it was a very pleasant uh, chat and conversation with you guys today. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you, Maya. Oh, thanks so much. Yeah, thank you for doing this. Thank you. My pleasure.